When I went back 10 years ago and looked at all of the annual reports of all the major energy companies, not one of them imagined, and I'm not saying this is a critique, I'm just saying not one of them imagined 10 years ago that America would ever be energy independent. And now read them today and you'll find out every one of them has a scenario that says what? Yeah, hey, we can do this. They all have different dates. But we can do this. But if you count net energy value, we exported more than we imported two years ago. And nobody saw it. Huh. So let me tell you the one sustainable economic principle you need to burn into your brain and is this, okay? Let me feed you in the United States. How much does it take to eat in the United States? Despite what the press says, it has not gone up in the last few years. It has, in fact, gone down. And I'm going to use disposable income. Because disposable means what? We've already paid our obligation to Uncle Sugar, states and local governments. This is what you've got left to live on. Okay? So this is disposable. Average American in the United States spends 9.6% of their disposable income to eat. The lowest it's ever been in history. And the lowest in the world. Now, I'm going to buy your booze, because I truly do think booze is important. <laughs> no, I'm not supposed to say that, but I do. Because I found out, you know what? Beer has food value. Food has no beer value. <laughs> I'm going to feed you, I'm going to buy your booze, and then I'm going to let you do what the average American does, which is eat one out of every two meals. Where? Just like we did today away from home. I've fed you, bought you booze, let you eat out. Now how much of your disposable income have I consumed? It is the lowest it's ever been in history. And it is the lowest in the world. And it's 13%. Our friends in Canada, it's slightly less than 16%. Second lowest in the world, lowest it's ever been in Canada. Now I'm going to do something else for you. I'm going to buy you a house. I'm going to buy you a house in the United States of America. Okay? And I'm going to buy the average 2010 census house, which is 2,400 square feet, two and a half bathrooms, three bedrooms. I'm going to buy you a house. Do you understand how important that is? I can stand before 6,668 institutions of higher education in the United States of America and 603 in Canada and tell them this. Never in the history of keeping records in modern times is it cheaper to own a house. I don't know about you. I kind of like that. The first home I purchased in 1979 in Las Cruces, New Mexico, my fixed rate 30-year mortgage was 11%. When I said it in front of a colleague, he said, quit bragging, mine was 17. You think we were upside down on our mortgages? Kind of. <laughs> we weren't bright enough to calculate them. And now I'm going to buy and pay for your utilities where you're neither hot nor cold. And you understand that average home has got indoor plumbing. The ranch I grew up in on the Panhandle of Texas, we got indoor plumbing at age seven. Okay? We're not that far away from a generation not having the convenience of indoor plumbing. And most importantly, heating and cooling, because my late father said, you want, you want an air conditioner? Open the window. I'm not saying it's wrong or right, I'm just trying to tell you, guess what? I'm going to buy you a home, pay your utilities, including hooking you up to the internet and phone service. Now you understand what I've done for the average American. I've fed you, bought you booze, let you eat every other meal away from home. I bought you an average home, which is a nice one. I paid your utilities, hooked you up to the internet and phone service. Now how much of your disposable income have I consumed? It is the lowest it's ever been in history, and it is the lowest in the world. 31%. Now, my late father told me, do not do math in public, so I did this one earlier. <laughs> Subtract 31% from 100%. If I did it right earlier, I get 69%. Average American, average American has 69% of their disposable income left after eating, drinking, eating every other meal away from home, owning a home, paying their utilities, they're neither hot nor cold, hooked to the world, and they have 69% of their income left. To do what? Anything they want to. 
That is phenomenal. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has three or two bucks in it, okay? They decided that they were going to take all that money and go help people in impoverished parts of the world with their health. But when they got there, they found out, guess what? They couldn't separate out health from their lifestyles. And most of those people were in subsistence agriculture. They were just getting by. They had no crack factor. But they found this. Slightly over half of those impoverished people were subsistence farmers and they were females. And so when they gave to the female farmers the same resources that male farmers got, sometimes just micro loans of five bucks, sometimes just education, learning how to plant a seed, sometimes just another seed, sometimes just a little bit of information. When they gave them that, guess what happened? 30% increase from the women. And what did they spend that 30% increase on? <laughs> Shoes, you'd like to say. <laughs> Actually, women are hardwired. We are, you're hardwired. You're hardwired to take care of family. So they spend it on better diets for their children and education. What did the men want to spend it on? <laughs> well, men are hardwired for protection. So their attitude was, what good is a better diet, what good is an education if you're robbed or killed on the way to school? So they wanted to spend it on protection. Neither wrong nor right, just guess what? Gee, folks, you got four billion people out of the 7.2 that are just about there, but what's happening to their crap factor worldwide because of a little knowledge? It's growing. And if you saw the cover of The Economist magazine just a few months ago, you saw one of the most phenomenal charts that just made my soul sing. Because on it was a chart that went this way down. And it was just 20 years ago, there were 2 billion people on the planet that lived on less than $1.25 a day. And now in the world, it is 750 million. subsistence you only do it when people have a little bit of money to do what create a market do things weird this suit this tie it'll go out of fashion rational people will buy new ones I'm an economist I'll continue to wear them for another 20 years <laughs> oh, you're in financial services and I know this but isn't it interesting this one nobody ever t chooses to tell you this in the United States okay I think it's pretty important the world this year will produce a gross domestic product of about $70 trillion. The Economist magazine takes countries that produce a billion plus, there's 195 of them, and this year, by the time it ends, will produce a world economy of about $70 trillion. The U.S. economy will be 17. The closest economy to us officially, the second largest economy last year. China will probably become so this year, but they wanted to the last two years, but nobody believes their numbers. Okay. Okay. But officially, the second largest country is Japan at six trillion. Hmm. 17 for us. But more importantly than that, <laughs> and this is why it's important, the world will produce 70 trillion. Our 119 million households in America have a collective net worth, net worth of 72 trillion. There's a bunch of money out there. It's phenomenal. One that we invented when we thought a rock had weapons of mass destruction. We asked the scientists at Los Alamos to design something because they knew when the UN inspectors would go to these places, they would know and they would move those weapons. So they said, we need something that can measure whether these weapons have ever been in these rooms because we know they're going to move them if they had them. So they invented something, or one scientist did, called a LIB, a laser-induced breakdown spectrometer. And they were little handheld devices that could go into these rooms, zap it, it would do a spectrometer analysis of there, and it would tell them instantly whether there had been a weapon of mass destruction in any of those places. And of course they found none. But that same technology, ladies and gentlemen, is on our Mars Curiosity rover. Zapping Mars soil, trying to tell us what? Whether it has life. 
that same scientist is working with one of my scientists at New Mexico State University so that I can do it for soil and know whether there's an abundance of nitrogen or phosphorus or potash, or more importantly, what is the microbe content because we know in a microbe-rich soil that will absorb and be a carbon sequestration pool eight times larger than a normal. It is a whole new field of study now called epigenetics because we find out the moment you are born, guess what? Your DNA starts moving and you're different than your identical twin. It's a whole field of study. We go, what? So everybody's DNA is a little bit different. So now I can say, guess what? That bad cholesterol for you? <laughs> your body thinks it's candy. <laughs> hmm. Get ready for a world where you won't sit down at this meal without taking that app and deciding whether it's good for you or bad for you. I call it prescription food. We're babes in the woods. If you want to have healthy people, the science is telling us every day you can't separate them from plants and animals and people. You try, can't do it. Let me start with the first one. Married men get what's known as the marriage premium. Married men live on average three years longer than single men. Okay, it's true. The reason single men don't live very long is the last thing a single man says before he dies is always, hold my beard and watch this. So single men do not live very long. Okay. Okay. Married men get a three-year marriage premium. Women don't get it. You live forever anyways, we joke, but guess what? Women don't get the marriage premium. Men do. We've also found in surveys that married men are more willing to die, but they do live three years longer. <laughs> And here comes science that helped us out on this one, and it is this. I, if I ask you, name as fast as you can your closest friend, and I say it to a man, you know the person we name most often? Our spouse. No, you can't name your spouse. Name as fast as you can your closest friend, not your spouse. The second person we name? Our dog. <laughs> Men name, instinctively, our spouse and our dog. That's our friends. <laughs> No, you can't name your spouse and dog. Name as fast as you can, close male friends, and we're speechless. We go, male friend? I think George likes me. We struggle. We name three. We ask women, name as fast as you can, female friends. You can't shut up. In the time it takes us to name three, you name ten. You don't get the marriage premium because guess what? You already have rich, what we call rich and deep social connections. And you go, oh yeah, whoopee. Whoopee's right, because we're just babes in the woods on this one, okay? My wife is five feet tall, weighs 100 pounds when it's raining. We've been married 29 years, been together 33. I love this woman. I think. Because <laughs> it could be biochemistry, okay? What I know is this, when I'm in her presence, I'm just giddy. When I'm not, I drink. <laughs> Either way, I'm giddy. Okay? <laughs> but the reason I'm giddy is this. <clears throat> Just found this out in the last two years. If you are in the presence of somebody you like, generally your children, but not always. Generally your spouse or another, but not always. If you're in the presence of somebody you like, your body starts producing what's called bonding chemicals. They're steroids. They contribute to your immune system. To date, we've identified over 100 of them. One of the most pronounced ones is one called oxytocin. And oxytocin, if you know anything about it, just makes you giddy. And you go, well, nice story. <laughs> Pull down hundreds of long-term epidemiological studies, and we picked 114 because they measured something, but they chose not to report it, and what they measured was this. Do you have rich and deep social connections, or do you not? And those that have rich and deep social connections died from all causes, all causes, one-fourth the rate of those that did not. It is 100% mathematically reciprocal, meaning if you don't have rich and deep social connections, you died from all causes at four times the rate of those that had rich and deep social connections. Yeah, we need people. Need to be around them. 1970, it's slightly less than 4 billion people on the planet. Agriculture could not produce enough calories that every man, woman, and child had 2,700 calories. 
couldn't do it. We could do it in this country. We could do it in Canada. We could do it in most of Europe. But we couldn't do it for the world. Four billion people. And we couldn't produce 2,700 calories for each man, woman, and child. I'm very happy to report to you today that guess what? With 7.2 billion people on this planet, we now have succeeded in producing almost 2,800 calories for all 7.2 billion people. That's a pretty good accomplishment. Okay. My wife and I had a Chesapeake Bay Retriever. Most wonderful creature I ever had on the planet, other than my wife. <laughs> she lived on this earth 15 years and 60 days. And I noticed during the last few days, a few months of her life, she would be unsettled. My wife and I would lay down just because we loved her, put our arm around her, and in a few minutes her breathing would ease. And she would go to sleep, and so would we. What we found out was, guess what? Just six months ago, and in about 20 minutes, her oxytocin levels and ours was what? Identical. It's a beautiful room. No tree, plants in it much. What do you think happens when people are around plants? In about 20 minutes, what happens to their oxytocin levels? You wanna have healthy people you can't separate them from plants and animals and people. And nobody for 103 years has done that better than Scouting. The most wonderful thing you will ever learn is to love the plants and animals and people and in return be loved. Thanks for what you do.